Oklahoma Gardening is a production of the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the land-grant mission of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University, dedicated to improving the quality of life of the citizens of Oklahoma through research-based information. Underwriting assistance for our program is provided by the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry, helping to keep Oklahoma green and growing. Today on Oklahoma Gardening, host Casey Hinches has a showy, proven shrub for the landscape. We continue our series on ornamental grasses with some perennials. There's a tour of a special garden at the Oklahoma County OSU Extension Office. And Barbara Brown cooks a healthier take on an Oklahoma comfort food staple. favorite small trees is the Vitex or Chase tree with its palmate bluish green foliage and flowers that come in a range from white to pink to blues and purples and being drought tolerant and easy to care for what's not to love about this tree it typically will get to about a 15 foot height and depending on the situation it can sucker and be a reseeder with all that in mind while this is a small tree it might be more space than you can dedicate However, now with the new cultivar called Blue Puffball, you can have the beauty of the Vitex in a very small space. You can see it maintains about a three foot height and it's nice and rounded without any pruning. Now this particular one we've had growing in a pot. So um, it's cold hardy to zone six in the ground, but again, being in a pot, it's gonna be a little bit more tender, but it's overwintered here in still water for us in this pot for a couple of years. Now Vitex, by nature, they'll tend to die back a little bit, especially when they're newly planted. So you might find that if you plant it in a container, it will die back. All of this is new growth that's come on this year. But as Vitex roots mature more and more, they'll regrow from that woody growth in the following years. Now, as the name implies, this is going to have blue flowers. But if you're looking for a cultivar that has pink flowers, look for one called Pink Pinnacle. If you're looking to add some height into your landscape but aren't ready to commit to planting a small tree or small shrub, maybe you should think about considering planting perennial grasses. There are several that get several feet tall and will add that height into your landscape. One is this ravina grass that we have right here. You can see it averages out about 8 to 10 feet tall, but once it starts blooming it can get up to 12 feet in height. Um, hardy to zone 5, this is often used as a substitute in colder climates as uh, the pampas grass and therefore it's often referred to as hardy pampas grass. Now it's got a little bit different of a, a plume than the pampas grass, it has a bit more of a narrow, sharper looking plume to it. I do have to add a word of caution, however, in Oklahoma and in southern climates, this plant can be invasive. And in fact, this is listed on Oklahoma's invasive plant list. So you can see here we have it planted in a very manicured, maintained landscape and it's been controlled. In that setting, it's okay, but if you're going to plant this anywhere else, you need to be very cautious and I would not recommend planting it in open areas where it can naturalize easily especially in moist areas where it can really take off and develop a monoculture stand that can um, prevent other grasses from growing and can even block waterways. Because we are in zones anywhere from six to seven, we can actually plant pampas grass. And so that would be one that I would recommend actually. This is uh, pampas grass here. You can see it has a little bit finer leaf blade to it, but it's a nice stately grass to add either individually, it will make a nice focal point, or you can plant it in a row and use it as a wind block. 
while most of them get to be about six feet tall, it's going to be the plumes that you're really after. That's really what it's desired for, as they almost look like feather dusters on top of the plant. Now most of them have either an ivory cream or white plume, but there is a cultivar called Pink Feathers that has a pink plume to it. Now most of these are only hardy to zone seven, but if you're in northern Oklahoma, there is a cultivar called Blue Bayou, which is hardy to zone six. Coming down in size a little bit, we have several miscanthus grasses to choose from. There's miscanthus grimsillimus, which is kind of the traditional, it's an oldie but goodie um, landscape plant. It's a green landscape plant that's similar to this, only it has a silver midrib in it. Um, and it's one that you'll often find all over towns and landscapes. Now there's also um, some that have a little bit more variegation to them. Uh, again, these maintain a three to five foot height on them. There's gold bar, which has more of an upright growth to it and has a variegation that runs perpendicular to the leaf blade, and it has a yellow variegation to it. There's also one that has a bit more of a fountain habit to it, and so it weeps a little bit, but with a perpendicular white band across the leaf blade, and that's known as zebra grass. Now, if you would like the look of zebra grass, but wanted to have more of an upright growth, look for a cultivar called porcupine or strictus, um, and that's gonna give you that upright growth, but again, with the perpendicular banding across that leaf. Here I'm standing by a cultivar called Morning Light, which is similar to Gracilimus, but it actually has a uh, variegation on the outside or the margins of the leaves. You can also see the leaves tend to be a little bit more narrow, and so as you look at it from a distance, it has just a nice kind of a, a golden yellow glow to the whole form and shape of the plant. Now all of these that I've mentioned have a little bit smaller leaf blade. If you're wanting a bolder appearance, you might try Rigoletto or Cabaret, which we also have featured here in our ornamental grass garden. Another mid-level popular ornamental grass is Calamagrostis or feathery grass. Um, one of the most popular cultivars is called Carl Forrester, and this plant will get much taller. It'll get to be about three to five feet tall, but you can see the plumes are a little bit more narrow, um, and they have this nice kind of tannish bronze color to them that they'll exhibit midsummer through the rest of the season. Now this plant, it has more of a vertical appearance which really offers nice lines in the gardens versus the weeping nature of some of the other ornamental grasses. Now one thing all of those perennial grasses that we've talked about so far have in common is that they're all clumping grasses for the most part, which means when you plant them in the ground, they're pretty much going to stay right there in that same location. You might see a little bit of spreading or the growth of that clump, but it's where you plant it is where it's going to stay, and you'll notice that foliage coming out of the base of that plant versus some spreading grasses. There are grasses that spread, and what this means is they're actually going to travel by rhizomes across an area which allows that foliage to pop up and kind of create more of a mat of foliage. An example of a perennial uh, spreading grass is uh, blue lime grass. This is a popular grass that we have here and it actually is a cool season grass. So you'll see most of its growth in the spring and in the fall. But being hardy from zones four to 10, it's, it does quite well here in Oklahoma. Because it is a cool season grass, you might want to look at a cultivar called Blue Dune, which actually handles our heats just a little bit better. Um, this grass will get to be about three to five feet tall, and as you can see, kind of travel across the landscape. Another spreading perennial grass that you might try in your garden is called ribbon grass. You can see this one stays much shorter, only getting to a height of about two to three feet tall, which makes it work well in the foreground of your landscape. But you do want to make sure to give it some space because again, it's going to spread. Now this particular one is grown for its foliage, not necessarily for its flowers, as those are pretty um, unnoteworthy. But this one is variegated, but there's also a cultivar called uh, strawberry and cream, which is variegated and then has tips of pink on the ends of it. 
We had to come to our Japanese garden for our third spreading perennial ornamental grass. And this is Japanese blood grass that's next to us here. Sometimes mistaken for purple fountain grass because of the red foliage on it, but this is a perennial and a spreading grass. Um, and so it's not going to give you those big fountains that you would find on the purple fountain grass. Now again, I have to give a word of caution about this plant. The straight genus species, Imperata cylindrica, is actually listed on the federal noxious weed list. Now that does not include the cultivars Rubra or Red Baron, which are sold in the horticulture trade and are noted for having the red tips on their foliage. The straight genus species is a green uh, plant and there is some concern about whether this uh, cultivar will it's noted as being not invasive, that it doesn't spread, that it's less aggressive, and that it won't reseed. However, that is not backed by any data. And so I would say, if you see this reverting or reseeding in your landscape, you want to remove it immediately. Because this plant is hardy from zones five to nine, it's even more of a concern about its invasive qualities in the south from Texas to Florida up into the Carolinas. Um, some states such as Alabama have gone so far to even make it illegal for the owning, the selling, and even sharing of the horticulture cultivar rubra. All of these grasses that we've mentioned are perennial ornamental grasses, which means they're relatively easy to maintain in order to get them to come back year after year. All you're going to do is in late February, early March, you're going to want to prune back all of the foliage, um, which at that point would have died. You're going to prune that back to as low as you can on the crown of that plant typically around six to eight inches. Now, depending on some of these larger clumps of grasses, that can be a little difficult, but you wanna get that as tight as possible so that when that new growth starts coming out, you're gonna have a nice fountain grass effect and not have to see any of that remaining dead foliage. Now, you wanna leave that foliage through the winter months because one, it adds some nice height to our landscape that can often look flat in the winter time. Also, it provides nice cover for wildlife and it will help uh, kind of mulch and, and blanket that uh, grass through those winter months, especially on something that might be a little bit marginally hardy, such as the pampas grass. I'm here in the teaching and demonstration garden section of our gardens here at the Oklahoma County Extension Office. This has been an ongoing project for the last year or so as we try to develop some teaching and demonstration areas around our campus that can be utilized both for passive education as people just walk through our campus uh, coming and going for different activities and also utilized as we, as we do specific workshops uh, as kind of a hands-on component for the education that we do. This happens to be the Oklahoma proven portion of our teaching and demonstration gardens here. And so all of the plants that you'll find in this portion of the gardens are Oklahoma proven plants. They've been highlighted over the past 21 years in the Oklahoma proven program. Uh, and the Oklahoma proven uh, program or, or promotion, plant promotion program is highlighting trees, shrubs, annuals, and perennial plants that have proven to be hardy, well-adapted plants that will be successful in almost any Oklahoma landscape. The gardens here were a sponsorship from the Oklahoma City Community Foundation uh, through, through support from them and then a number of other organizations. We were able to acquire enough funding to start building our landscape and teaching gardens here. One of the unique things about what we've done with these gardens here are not just put in nice looking plants, but we've actually done some labels. So we have some labels on our plants, which allow people as they're passing through to engage with each plant and have a learning opportunity, whether they're just passing through passively, walking from, uh, from our courtyard into our building or in our classes as we're, as we're doing some of the the teaching in our classes, we can utilize this signage as well. So what we have here 
is an example of some of the signage that you'll find in our gardens. It lists the year that this plant was in the Oklahoma Proven program. You can see 2012 Oklahoma Proven. It gives the common name, the botanic name, and the, the individual uh, cultivar. What's unique about this signage, you find signage like this in, in almost any garden, but we've put QR codes on much of the, the plants. And so as you come through the landscape, you find a plant that you're interested in, you wanna learn more about, you can actually take your cell phone. And now almost any cell phone camera can be used to scan the QR code and it will instantly take you to the Oklahoma Gardening YouTube page where you can watch a specific YouTube video about this plant. So you'll learn from Casey about the care and maintenance of this specific plant. Our gardens here are open to the public and we encourage anybody that's uh, in the area, whether you live in Oklahoma City or you're just visiting the uh, Oklahoma County, to come and look at our gardens. We want this to be an area where people can come and relax and learn about horticulture. And so we encourage you, if you're gonna be in Oklahoma County, if you're gonna be near our facility, to come and see what we have to offer. about summer gardening we're often talking about tomatoes and peppers but I wanted to take a minute to look at another member of the Solanaceae family that also makes a great summer uh, crop to add into your garden and this is an eggplant now I wanted to highlight this particular plant um, this time of year because this is kind of how the plant got its name eggplant because if you look down in here you can see these lovely white oval shaped uh, fruit now because it is in the Solanaceae family, it's actually considered a berry, like tomatoes. And so you can eat this whole um, fruit, both the skin, the flesh, and the seeds. And so what we're going to do is just harvest these off by cutting a little bit of the stem. You don't want to twist them or anything like that. Uh, you can see this particular one is called the Japanese white egg eggplant. And as the name implies, you get these egg-like fruits. And I always want to let people know to harvest them. You can really harvest them anytime. Immature is okay. But you want to harvest them before they start turning brown. Um, once they start turning brown, they're actually kind of declining at that point. Also, when you harvest them, they don't keep very long in your kitchen. So you want to go ahead and utilize them right away. The other thing is like an apple, when you cut them, they're going to oxidize really quickly. So you might start seeing them turn brown within about a minute. So go ahead and cut them and then add them into your dish. They work well in stir fries or just on the grill. While eggplants don't add a lot of nutritional value to your meal, they're used culinarily because they absorb so much flavors like in a stir fry. The other thing I want to mention about this particular plant is that it's a fairly small eggplant. So if you're new to trying eggplant, this is a great one. You won't have these monster fruit to have to figure out how to cook. You have these smaller ones and they also work well in a container. So if you don't have a big vegetable garden, just try putting one in a pot on your patio. Today we're doing potatoes, peppers, and sausage. Now this is one of those recipes that you can adjust based on what you have. So I'll try and talk about that as we go through it. I'm going to start with two tablespoons of vegetable oil. I've got a skillet that is getting hot and we should be able to see that when you look at the oil, it's starting to uh, have that appearance of something that's hot. Now I've also got four table or four cups of potatoes that I've uh, red potatoes, didn't peel them, uh, cut them in half because I want them to be bite sized, cut them in about four uh, quarter of an inch slices. And we're gonna put them in here and try and get them so they are not double stacked or triple stacked as much as we can. Uh, Usually I find recipes or I adjust recipes uh, based on uh, what I think folks will have, what time they have. This one took a lot more adjusting than usual. It started with a pound of potatoes, which would be about two to three cups. 
I increased the number of potatoes, decreased the amount of sausage, decreased the amount of oil, left out some butter. So I'm aware that these things happen when you have recipes, that it's not uh, just start at once and, and go. So uh, this one's a little bit of still a work in progress, so feel free to take it and adjust it when you start it at home too. We're going to leave these again, try and get it at, as much at one layer, and then I want it to crisp up a little bit on one side, so I'm going to not turn it or not flip it uh, for somewhere between five to six minutes. At that point, get your uh, spatula under there, see if it's starting to turn brown and crispy, then flip them all over and let them cook another four to five minutes until they're crispy on that side. Then we'll come back and uh, take another step. Uh, as we go through this, however, I'm going to season it just a little bit. I'm going to put about a fourth of a teaspoon of pepper in here. I'm not going to put any salt in. That was another one of my adjustments. Uh, because we're using a smoked sausage, or you could use a kielbasa, uh, it just gets too salty when you get all those ingredients. So adjust it for your own taste when it's done, rather than here at the beginning. I've left out a half a teaspoon of salt already. All right, once this is brown, and uh, just test it, for, uh, press it with, a, um, with, a, with your spatula or with a fork or the end of a knife, and when it is uh, done enough and tender enough, to your liking, then go ahead and take it out of the pan and transfer it to something else. Uh, now we're going to add the sausage. Now this is again one of those things that I cut back on, so you can flex with it uh, as you choose. If you want to reduce the fat even more, you could use a turkey variety, but this is uh, a kielbasa. You could use a smoked sausage equally well. If there is no oil left in the pan, and I think you can probably see that we still have a little bit of oil left from our uh, potatoes, uh, we want these to brown too, so we want these uh, again down in the, the one layer rather than two. And we're going to cook these, uh, stirring them every uh, few minutes uh, for somewhere between four to six minutes. Okay. You don't have to get these super brown because they're going to stay in the oven while we continue to add other things. I've got a medium onion. You can use whatever kind of onion you've got. I like a red one. It was a little bit sweeter. Uh, it also uh, has uh, a little bit more color, a different color. We've got a lot of uh, colors going on already, but I like that one. Uh, and then a green pepper. Now, I've got about a cup of green pepper. Depends on how big your green peppers are as to how many of them you're going to need. And then one or two cloves of garlic, and around a, a teaspoon. So again, it's going to depend. I know that when I do gardening, my green peppers are very, very small. So I might need as many as three to get a cup. Uh, but, and you could also switch up the kind of pepper that you have. If you wanted something a little bit spicier, you could uh, put in a different kind of pepper uh, to give it a little bit more zing. And we're going to stir these around a little bit. These you're going to come back to and stir fairly often. Most of the things we've had in the pan thus far, you've pretty much been able to let sit and do their own thing so that while the potatoes were cooking, you could have been cutting the other vegetables and cutting the meat slices and that kind of thing. This you're going to keep an eye on a little bit more closely because you don't want it to scorch. But while you're doing it, you can see the, the tasty bits on the bottom of the pan. You're going to get some liquid come out of these vegetables as they cook, and that, those crusty bits are called fond. Uh, go ahead and try and scrape those up as you go. The, the more liquid that comes out of the onions and the peppers as it's cooked, the easier that's going to be. But there's a lot of flavor in there, so you want to try and, and move that out of the pan when you move the vegetables out. This is going to cook a total of uh, four to five minutes. Again, it's not a constant stirring kind of uh, event like I seem to be uh, intent on doing. The goal is to get the onions so they're starting to become translucent, and then we're going to add the potatoes back. So once you get them in there, then stir them around a little bit. You just need to get them so they're hot again, since they've been sitting out. Now, if you don't like the amount of uh, fat that you use, you needed the fat with the potatoes in order to get them to crisp up. But if you decided that it was going to be more than you wanted to eat, you can line the plate, or the pie pan in this case, with paper toweling, so that some of that drains off, because you're not going to need it anymore, and there will have been more that comes out of, of the sausage. So just stir those around when they're as hot as you would like. Dinner's ready. Now you've had plenty of time while this, while this cooked. It didn't take a lot of effort. Some of the, the cutting and chopping of the onions, the peppers, the garlic, those things can be done ahead. The meat can be sliced ahead of time. So if, if this is a, I'm coming home from work, I don't want to spend a half an hour, you really don't have to spend much time in order to get this to finally go together. This will serve at least four people. 
And you can adjust the number of people that it will serve by adding or subtracting either potatoes or uh, other ingredients. You could also add other vegetables to this. Uh, for instance, you could put some summer squash in here and that would uh, make it a really nice addition as well. You'd want to add it fairly late because otherwise it's going to break down too much. There you have it. A little bit of either green onions or maybe some chives if you've got those to the top. Uh, if you don't have them, it still has a lot of color. You could also have some red pepper in there that would really boost the color too. I hope you'll give this one a try. It's potatoes, peppers, and sausage. For Oklahoma Gardening, I'm Barbara Brown. There are lots of great horticultural events this time of year. Be sure and consider these activities when you're making your plans for the weeks ahead. Next week, Casey treks through the prairie to look at some native grasses for the landscape. We'll get a start on our fall vegetables, we'll cut and dry herbs, and Barbara Brown will have a safe method for infusing oil with herbs. We wish you health and wellness, and we'll see you next week for more Oklahoma Gardening. To find out more information about show topics, as well as recipes, videos, articles, fact sheets, and other resources, including a directory of local extension offices, be sure and visit our website, oklamagarding.okstate.edu. And we always have great information, answers to questions, photos, and gardening discussions on your favorite social media as well. Join in on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can find this entire show and other recent shows, as well as individual segments on our Oklahoma Gardening YouTube channel. And tune in to our OK Gardening Classics YouTube channel to watch segments from previous hosts. Oklahoma Gardening is produced by the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University. The Botanic Garden at OSU is home to our studio gardens and we encourage you to come visit this beautiful Stillwater Jewel. We would like to thank our generous underwriter, the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry. Additional support is also provided by Pond Pro Shop, Greenleaf Nursery and the Garden Debut Plants, the Oklahoma Horticultural Society, and the Tulsa Garden Club.